you know, <laughs> I'm, you know, there's a lot of the bad guys cast a lot of wide nets. Yeah, and there'll be a there'll be a known exploit of a Windows 7 operating system, yeah. right? And they'll just try to hammer that exploit on every IP address in the world. Yeah. Pretty dumb. Yeah. But if you're the one company that didn't do the patch management, well, the bear got you. Yeah. Yeah. The most important thing is that end-to-end -end communication, right? So that that all my I'm trying to quarantine all my critical data behind my network, whether that's a virtual network or a physical one or up in Amazon somewhere, we're trying to build a big fence around that network. And if anybody wants to get at any node in that network, they need to walk through a thoughtful authentication process. And that's next on Bootstrapping Your Dreams show. So the big question is this, how are ambitious people like us who don't have a lot of resources, did not go to Ivy League colleges, were not born into wealth, how do we become resourceful enough? Use our creativity, our dedication, and a little bit of crazy to bootstrap our way to realizing our dreams. Whether it is launching a new company, launching a new app, or making it to the top of the corporate ladder. That is the question. And this podcast will give you the answers. Hey listeners and viewers, we have created a tremendous community of bootstrappers, entrepreneurs and professionals who are ambitious, resourceful and want to get things done. We brainstorm, support and help each other out. Come join us, navigate to bootstrapping.group. That is bootstrapping.group. If you like this video, do not forget to hit that like button now. Or if you want us to improve our content, go ahead and hit the thumbs down button and give us your feedback in the comment section below. Here at Tetra Noodle, we are passionate about entrepreneurship, technology and innovation. Every week, we bring you insightful and engaging interviews, tips, tricks and strategies to help you grow your business or rise in your corporate profession. So if you're new here, please consider subscribing. And do not forget to hit that bell icon so that you are notified when we publish new content. Hello and welcome to this new episode of Bootstrapping Your Dreams Show. I'm your host, Manoj Agarwal, and today we'll be talking with Brian Gill. So Brian is a computer scientist, a fellow computer scientist, entrepreneur, angel investor, due to his firm belief that data recovery shouldn't be prohibitively expensive uh, Brian founded Gilware, where he is, and uh, he and his team specializes in cyber risk assessments, data recovery, and incident response. Brian not only speaks about his own journey in his business growth, but is dedicated to educating small business owners, startups, and entrepreneurs about how to protect themselves from cracker hackers, providing actionable tips that they can put into practice today. So, welcome, Brian. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. All right. So you are a security guy. Let's start there. Um, security is uh, is you know a subject that I'm uh, familiar with, and uh, I have a good amount of expertise in. Uh, but I'm amazed at how many people do not understand security, yet they are so paranoid about it. So let's start the conversation there. What is your take on uh, cybersecurity, and how much people understand what it really means? Yeah. Um, really, we could talk for hours about this, but. Um, so we kind of fell backwards into security. So I'm a computer scientist, um, was a programmer for a number of years and worked at a lot of banks and financial institutions and um, got to see behind the scenes of what you would think are some really best practices. But the reality was, you know, even as a young person at 22, 23 years old, I was like, really, are they going to give me access to all this information? Yeah. Like, do they know what they're giving me here? Yeah. Like I've worked here for three weeks <laughs> and I can just run a SQL query on a live production database and download millions of records. It, it didn't seem right to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, before I had even any exposure or training and then we, we started our company Gilware, which does uh, essentially gets people out of data related disasters, which traditionally were like server crashes or, you know, virtual machine corruptions or human errors but over the last five or six years, it's really been more about ransomware yeah. and 
businesses getting their their networks hijacked and all their data encrypted and then they get back to work on Monday and they don't have access to anything and there's a ransom demand. Yeah, yeah. And we started getting calls and calls and calls and calls and started to help people through those crises and then eventually it was just needed to, to partner up with another set of people here in Wisconsin, uh, one of which is Cindy Murphy, who's a kind of worldwide thought leader in digital forensics. Mm -hmm. And we founded a forensics company a couple of years ago. And we provide one of our biggest lines of business is what's called incident response, mm -hmm. where companies got hacked. It's too late to do any defense for them because the bad guys are already on the network and have been there for three or four months, usually on average. Mm -hmm. And we help them untangle all that mess, deal with getting their data recovered, um, deal with sometimes negotiating with the criminals themselves to, you know, try to get the data at a price point that makes sense for all parties. Mm -hmm. And then even dealing with the logistics of moving around lots of money into, you know, cryptocurrencies and all this stuff that the client has no experience with and just doesn't want to deal with. Yeah. More importantly, we also provide risk assessment services where after they get burned, they sign up for our risk assessment services where our team goes in and month over month, we learn about their business, we define a roadmap, and then we help them ascertain like what are the priorities and what are we going to tackle for the next eight weeks. And then we actually help assist with watchdogging that and making sure that they take those steps. So, I mean, long story short is, you know, uh, as far as just general knowledge, everybody has, you know, they log on to their, to their news feed and their Google News and their Twitter, and every day they see, oh, Capital One just got hacked. You know, that one was like yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but, you know, yesterday, Capital One, a single person, and uh, it looks like an old employee of Amazon who's a programmer, uh, but a disgruntled one apparently doesn't work there anymore and uh, decided to hack into Capital One, right? Mm -hmm. And you might think, oh, Capital One, they must have had, they didn't have their stuff together. They, they weren't doing all the right things. They weren't spending money on defense, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I brought up uh, a product on LinkedIn that lets me just kind of search for, you know, people on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And my criteria in that search was how many people at Capital One currently employed there have an acronym CISSP, which is an acronym which signifies that they're a certified security professional, right, mm -hmm. for, for the internet-related stuff. Yeah. They have 244 people yeah. currently working at Capital One, or at least that's what LinkedIn says, that have that CISSP certification, mm -hmm. which is you know, in the markets where Capital One is, those people with that certification are probably making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Yeah. Which if you run the math, they definitely spent 40 to $50 million just on humans last year, yeah. let alone systems and network monitoring services and software and networking equipment. And they lost, I think it was a couple hundred thousand people's social security numbers and roughly a hundred million people's you know, other miscellaneous data like their credit score and addresses. I mean, wow. You know, if Capital One can't prevent it, or if, if Equifax can't prevent it, what is what is a business with 100 employees or, or 500 employees or 50 employees or one employee? Yeah. What chance do they have? Yeah. And it's super easy to just fall into apathy like, oh, boy, I don't know what to do. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And for those like C-level executives, like, you know, maybe they're a little, got a little gray hair in their beard like me, mm -hmm. and they don't know anything about computers or computer science or hacking. And, you know, they've like seen some of those terrible movies with some guy in a keyboard banging away. And, yeah. you know, they've seen the matrix a couple times, you know, like they don't, they're, they're embarrassed to even ask for basic help. Yeah. Like, they're like, I don't know. I have an IT guy and he does stuff for me and I'm, I'm sure we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like that, that head in the sand mentality of it's such a huge problem and it's so confusing and it's getting worse every day. And I'm just going to go back to these easy problems that 
like running my business and making more sales and I'll just go work on my website and run another ad yeah. or talk to some clients or close some more deals or whatever it is I'm really good at. And I don't even want to worry about that hacking thing. Exactly. That, that apathy is the problem. Yeah. And the problem can seem so vast and it can be so confusing of what are the basic steps I could take today and in like, you know, October and November and December. It's so confusing. People do nothing. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And, uh, and the, the lack of information is it gives rise to apathy and security is such an important topic. And if people don't understand, they either, as you said, they, they put their heads in, in the sand or they get super paranoid and they just keep asking questions which do not make sense. Like, make sure it's secure. Make sure the system logs you out. And, and you know, like, <laughs> it think that it's and uh, one one person I you know not to make fun but you know just to just to highlight the the level of understanding people have like they said okay let's put all the data in blockchain then it'll be secure <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it doesn't work that way um, but tell us uh, you know what are the simple things as you put it you know there are simple measures people can take what are some of these simple measures that uh, solopreneurs, small businesses, startups can take to prevent these type of issues? So, so first thing is if you're a solopreneur or you have like a dozen employees, right? There are a handful of things that you, that you can and should do. Um, most people are traveling on business. They need to be able to log into their network remotely mm. and they, they will like use remote desktop yeah, to, yeah. to do so a lot of times, yeah. right? Yeah. Your small business, net, you need a network that network needs to have some thought put into its user permissions. Mm -hmm. Not everybody should be able to see everything. Yeah. Um, and for most businesses, users should not be able to like install software. They just should not have that permission. Yeah. There needs to be a firewall that's kind of between you and that remote desktop. Yeah. And that firewall needs a two factor authentication. Mm -hmm. A username and password is not good enough. It just isn't these days, yeah, yeah. Um, especially because users have such weak passwords in general. They have that same password for everything. Yeah. And what can happen, and as you probably know, those passwords can get stolen. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes not even through my fault. Mm -hmm. Yahoo got hacked. Yeah. And Yahoo lost my password because mm -hmm. they weren't storing it in a secure way. Yeah. And they got breached. And my, that thing that held on to all the passwords wasn't encrypted properly. And now my password, through no fault of my own, is well known to, to the criminals, right? Mm -hmm. And it's in a list of millions, hundreds of millions of owned passwords. Yeah. I can't have the same password for every service. I should never have the same password for, you know, that you should always have different passwords. And what I recommend for most people in... If anyone is watching, I don't know if, if, if this the video is going to be published or whatever, but there's a little tiny pr thing I have in my hand here, and I don't have any affiliation with these guys. This is a YubiKey, mm -hmm. and it, it replaces user and passwords. Yeah. You know, for any site that is U2F compatible, which is most services like Google, Facebook, most people are on platforms that are popular, and most popular platforms support the new security protocol. Yeah. And without this stupid little key, I don't get in right and that's why I have this one backed up <laughs> you know um, and, and you might think oh geez that sounds like super painful I mean it's like 50 bucks yeah. you can buy it on Amazon or again buy two of them if you want to be smart about it mm -hmm. set them up and then you won't get your passwords owned and you won't get fished you know another way it can happen as you know is uh, you get that email from a client sometimes a real business client of yours or a real friend of yours and it says, hey, go log into Dropbox because I, I have a piece of a document I need you to look at. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the name of the document makes sense in the context of our relationship. Yeah. They know I'm looking for a job because I'm a recruiter and he sent me an updated resume. Just log on to Dropbox to get it. This makes contextual sense because the bad guys are smart. Yeah. They're very freaking smart. Yeah. But what I didn't see is that it wasn't Dropbox.com. It was dr 0 Pots, you know, like they made a subtle misspelling 
of Dropbox. And if I'm just moving too quick, it looked like Dropbox. And I went and I logged into Dropbox. And it didn't work. Or maybe the bad guy reroutes me to the real Dropbox. And I'm like, oh, I don't see any weird document there. But what just happened is the bad guys just owned my Dropbox account. Yeah. They also have my IP address. And they also have a password that works for me. So if I have the same freaking password for every service, maybe they're going to try an RDP attack on my desktop tonight at 6 o'clock. And if I don't have a two-factor firewall, I am totally boned. And if I have something on Dropbox, like a passwords.excel file, like a lot of people have, yeah. well, again, they don't even need the RDP. Or you know, maybe they will anyways. But, you know, it's so simple to get, you know, bad, so don't have bad passwords. Get a two-factor firewall. And we could, again, we could talk about this for hours. I mean, off the top of my head, um, you know, those are, patch management is a really big one. I mean, every once in a while, people see the news. Oh, my gosh, like Windows has a horrible security flaw. Um, you know, uh, Apple just the other day, the Google security team actually published that there was five security flaws on your iPhone um, for the latest version of where you could just get a text and they could basically have root access to your phone. Yeah. So Apple just patched it. The problem is people don't always patch, yeah. right? Or their computer that needs to get patched. Well, I'm sorry, you know, it's, you're running like a Windows 2000 server on some old thing that you bought 13 years ago. And it, Windows doesn't patch that anymore, yeah. you know? So, you know, you have to have your systems patching themselves and you have to have a patch management strategy, you know, and those are just some of the basics, you know, again, social engineering training. If you're a solo person, just try to find like a single YouTube video of somebody talking about the ways that people try to trick you. Yeah. Just educate yourself, just dial up your paranoia from extreme to always a little skeptical, Yeah. you know? Um, but again, it's, um, and if your company is of a certain size or in certain industries like healthcare or financial, um, you really need, in my opinion, and, and again, take it with a grain of salt because we supply some of these services, but most benefit, most companies would benefit from bringing in an external third party that's not your normal managed service provider to come in and do that security audit because um, most small businesses are going to have an MSP. They're not going to have a full-time IT person because they can't afford that and it doesn't make any sense to have a full-time IT person making $100,000 a year for a company of 12 people. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah. But they need something. So what most do is they have an MSP. They have a timeshare. They pay $2,000 a month for somebody to manage their network. The companies that size even would benefit from running a security audit to make sure that that person that they're paying is actually locking their stuff down appropriately. Because um, sometimes people hire bad IT people and they don't things, set things up right. And a quick audit would determine like, whoa, like these are all major problems and you can get ahead of it. Um, so when your company gets to a certain level of success or if you're in those horrifying industries where the data is so sensitive that losing it can be a death sentence, it can start to make sense. And the last thing, as far as basic tips, once your company gets to a certain level of success, everybody should have some flavor of cyber insurance. Mm -hmm. They already have business insurance, or they probably do. But what you might be surprised by is that when you get burned in a in a cyber incident, that that policy is not going to help you. And you're going to be like, what? I've been paying thousands of dollars a year for business insurance. I just had this catastrophic event. And you're telling me my policy doesn't cover anything. And they're going to be like, yep, you needed a cyber policy for that. Yeah. yeah. And even if you have a cyber policy, how well do you understand what it's going to cover and not cover? The devil is in the details. And again, normal business people need a fundamental understanding of, of at least this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, they can't just bury their head in the sand, throw a couple grand at a secure, at a, at a local managed services person and just believe that everything's going to be great because yeah. it's a really dumb way to lose your whole business. Yeah. 
True enough. True. Um, but uh, as you put it, like you know, these are not very um, complicated steps. Uh, as long as you sort of you know commit yourself and uh, make sure if you follow up and make sure everything is in order, I think a lot of these incidents can be prevented. Of obviously, you know, not everybody is Capital One, not everybody is Equifax. Their data is much more valuable. So, yep. uh, you know, relatively speaking, for small business, the threat is also lower. But if you don't do anything, the you know, if you leave the doors open. It's, it's very easy for the bad guys to come. That, that's, ex that's exactly right. You know, the old adage is you don't have to be faster than the bear. Mm. You have to be faster than the person next to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, uh, I'm, you know, there's a lot of, the bad guys cast a lot of wide nets. Yeah. And there'll be a, there'll be a known exploit of a Windows 7 operating system. Yeah. Right. And they'll just try to hammer that exploit on every IP address in the world. Mm -hmm. Pretty dumb. Yeah. But if you're the one company that didn't do the patch management, well, the bear got you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing you brought up, which is very interesting, I'll share an incident about that, is firewalling. So, you know, um, this is about 10, 12 years ago, perhaps I was working with a, a fairly established company, about 100 people. And... You know, they had no firewalls and they had all the servers on um, on the internet. And I was like, you know, what what are you guys doing? And they're like, ah, forget it. Firewalls are for wimps. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was quite interesting. Uh, you know, luckily they didn't have major incident then, but later on uh, over the years they got into real big trouble. Uh, but you know, things are changing as uh, people are. Uh, implementing these uh, Wi-Fi wi -Fi routers which have firewalls built in. Uh, do you see that uh, things are improving in that sense that at least, uh, you know, people are deploying firewalls uh, by default, even if they don't understand it? Or uh, do you think it's not enough uh, and they need uh, another layer of protection, another custom firewall on top of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to be too cynical, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's actually getting worse. Mm -hmm. um, not from an overall threat, which definitely that's getting worse. I think people are doing less than they used to. Um, and I think, I think the, you know, the mythical cloud has a lot to do with that. I see, yeah. um, well, I don't, I don't have to worry about, a, I don't have to worry about a firewall. All our data is up in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. Well, if somebody penetrates your endpoint and your endpoint is logged into your freaking cloud yeah. then your cloud just got owned. Or if your password for your cloud is the same password that just got owned at that bad Wi-Fi you were at at the mall or in the airport, then, or you just, again, got fished, you know, it's, and, and again, most people just, they set the cloud up and great. Out of the box, these cloud service providers don't have things tightened down. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you want to log into some of our servers, well, you have, there's a bunch of different steps. Not only is it username and password, but it's also rotating codes. And it's also restricted by IP range. Even if somehow somebody got the username and password and they got, you know, the actual, you know, rotating code, they'd still say, no, I'm sorry. You know, your, your IP address is not right. Or even if the IP address was right, because they somehow hacked into our business network, you know, the Mac address on the machine wasn't right. So everybody can get got, but there's a lot of work that can be involved with tightening things down to at least be faster than the bear, yeah. you know, and you can't just say, well, I put everything up on Amazon. Well, now that's actually maybe easier mm -hmm. if you don't set it up right. Yeah. And if you don't take the steps to lock it down, or if the person, if you shopped for three or four managed service providers, and you just picked the cheapest one. Yeah. Maybe there's a reason it's the cheapest one and it's that they're the less competent. Yeah. And they're not going to set things up properly and, and do that extra work up front. Or maybe they can't afford to spend that eight hours or that 40 hours to understand your business and make sure everything's locked down properly because you're not paying them for 40 hours. Yeah. You just wanted them to host your email, right? Yeah, so exactly. you kind of, uh, you know, pay now or pay later. There's a lot of adages I'll throw at you today. But, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and to your point about the cloud computing part, you know, a lot of people, 
try to secure the login and you know they have two factor authentication but when they put the data on they leave everything open so you know uh, there's a, there's a lot of complexity in securing end to end all your data and making sure access is uh, is tight so please do consider uh, talking to a professional uh, expert like uh, like Brian uh, yeah, or, uh, or not me personally or yeah, my yeah, company yeah. it's just somebody what, somebody who knows if you have a successful business this is not the kind of stuff I'd be super worried about in month six of my business, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But when you're making a living and you're having fun and you've got multiple employees and your business is on the upswing, you've got to resist temptation to just put all that profit in your pocket. You have to loosen up the purse strings. Yeah. And when things are starting to go well, that's the moment to make sure that they'll continue to go well. It's just the same thought process as business insurance. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Now, one point you uh, brought up, which is, again, I think uh, a lot of people need to understand is remote access. A lot of people travel. A lot of people need to access their servers. Um, and there are services available, go to, uh, go to my PC, remote login, those type of things. How secure are they? And is it the recommended way to connect back to uh, uh, your office while you're remote? Yeah, I mean, the, mo the most important thing is that end-to-end -end communication, right? So that, that all my, I'm trying to quarantine all my critical data behind my network, whether that's a virtual network or a physical one or up in Amazon somewhere. We're trying to build a big fence around that network. And if anybody wants to get at any node in that network, they need to walk through a thoughtful authentication process, right? And... To me, thoughtful is it's a registered machine that's, we know that machine, it's Brian's laptop, we know who that is, that, that particular machine. We know Brian is Brian because of his username and password and his thumbprint or whatever. And then obviously there's also the rotating smart code on his smartphone or dongle, you know, so that's the most important perspective is try to keep your data quarantined and then have a big plan on how you authenticate to get into that. Yeah. And, you know, if that happens and then I choose to use uh, go to my PC to then finally make that last jump, then that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, but again, if all you need is a username and password for go to my PC and then I can just click Brian's desktop and I'm in, well, then you're not good enough because all somebody needs to get all your stuff and maybe ransomware you or steal all your clients' information and spoof your email. And it could be an incredibly financially damaging, incredibly embarrassing, or just, you know, you, your whole business might be down for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. And not a lot of businesses can, some small businesses if you have a major outage like that where you're unable to provide those CAD designs or you're unable to provide those architectural stuff or code that you've been writing or whatever it is, you might not survive those client engagements with those unnecessary delays. Yeah. So, sure. yeah, just, you know, I, I don't have any particular problem with any methodology to then remote in, but it's all about if that methodology is bypassing the firewall, that is a big problem. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, here I will recommend, you know, this is just for, um, uh, you know, small businesses. And uh, I recommend the, there's a, a free firewall called PFSense. It has an a inbuilt um, SSL-based VPN um, and also IPsec-based VPN. So check it out. It's, it's absolutely free and it's, uh, it performs really well. Uh, now, let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey. Um, tell us, uh, you know, before the interview, you were telling me that you have bootstrapped uh, most of your businesses. So tell us about your journey. How how was your experience? What kind of uh, uh, obstacles did you face while bootstrapping your company? And yeah, yeah. So I was um, so I got my degree in computer science, and and this was in the early like pets dot com days of the first internet bubble. Mm -hmm. And I, I went out to the to the valley and went out to the San Francisco area and tried to get into a bunch of startups because I knew I wanted to work in an entrepreneurial company and that didn't go real well. No. Um, some of those companies are still around and I kind of did okay. But one company I was at, 
when the NASDAQ crashed and the whole thing went south, you know, I was like employee number 13, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was like the third software developer. And we went from 13 employees to about 160 employees in like a two and a half year period. Mm -hmm. So I thought we were going to IPO. I was going to be a millionaire. Life's going to be amazing. Then the NASDAQ crashed. And I was like, eh, who cares? You know, what do I care? Yeah. Um, well, our, our venture capital company decided to pull their funding. I see. So we had funding, and then we didn't. Mm -hmm. And we had hundred more than 150 employees, and our rent at our facility in Belmont was, I think, $300,000 a month. Wow. And we had zero money. So we shut the doors, and I was like, oh, okay. That was not cool. Um, I had personally, you know, about two or three months before that, I had taken, uh, I had a bunch of stock options and, you know, the, the nice HR people there, you know, let us know, hey, you know, it's looking, obviously, obviously things are looking great. And from a tax perspective, if you actually execute those options, then you'll have long-term stock and it'll be a lot better in a couple of years if we IPO. I see. So I wrote a check for more than $30,000 to execute as many options as I could afford, which was the bulk of the money that I had in my checking account. I see. So clearly that money, those, those stock was worth zero, you know, 12 weeks later. Yeah. And I knew I had a problem or a defect when it didn't bother me at all. <laughs> I woke up, I slept fine that night and I woke up in the morning and I was like, eh. Yeah, I knew why I was out there. Yeah. And I knew that I had made a calculated decision and there was some risk involved. I didn't expect it to be worthless 12 weeks later. Yeah. But it didn't, it really didn't bother me. And, and I'm like, geez, this should really bother me, you know? But I, I it was kind of a reaffirmation that uh, I, I'm comfortable with risk. I see. So um, I was kind of hoping the Valley would rebound. And most people that had kind of been around there said, geez, it's going to be five or six or seven years before. And it turned out to be a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up leaving. And, you know, kind of tucked my tail between my legs and kind of humped back to Wisconsin where I'm from because I've got a lot of family. And if I wasn't going to be in a startup out there, there was really no reason to be there. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing a really, you know, some boring jobs at insurance companies and cheese manufacturers and kind of was a programmer for hire. But I knew I wanted to start a business. And my younger brother, Tyler, was going to school at University of Wisconsin for computer science like I did. And he had the he had a hard drive crash. I see. And it had all his pictures from all his friends in high school on there. And he really wanted that data back. And he was researching it and only found two or three companies that even he thought did it. And when he called them, they quoted him, I think, $3,000, $5,000, which was more than his college tuition. Wow. So we were just kind of like, hmm, how hard could it be? You know, I'm a computer scientist. Uh, one of my good friends is a guy named Greg Pfeiffer. And he was a PhD. He was getting his PhD in nuclear engineering mm -hmm. and was an electrical engineer. One of my buddies, Scott, was a mechanical engineer. My brother, Wesley, was a mechanical engineer, computer science. So we had all the scientific backgrounds to try to tackle the reverse engineering and repair of these electromechanical devices. So we said, what the hell? Um, we bought a pallet of dead hard drives on eBay, mm -hmm. which you can do for some reason. Yeah. Um, and we just said, Hey, listen, if we can, if we can get data back on some of these things, then, then we'll start a business. Awesome. And we were able to pull, we were able to kind of cobble together success rates of maybe about four out of 10. We could pull some data off. I see. And it was pretty surprising how much stuff was on there. Mm -hmm. But we said, okay, so, you know, I, I, one of the companies I worked at was called Nextag and it was a big e-commerce platform. Mm -hmm. And I had exposure to, you know, uh, web making websites and managing pay-per-click campaigns. And again, this is pretty, still pretty early internet, but I had some exposure to that stuff. So I threw up a website. It didn't look all that great because I'm more of a backend developer. 
but I launched a pay-per-click campaign and we were the only lab at the time to advertise. So the, it was like five cents a click Nice. and people started to send us crap, um, which was surprising, but it was, those were some really fond memories of getting those first few dead hard drives in. Um, we, uh, we were in the basement of my apartment that I was renting at the time. Um, so it was not uh, officially a lab and we didn't really sell it as such. Yeah, yeah. Our website was pretty simple. And when I would talk to clients, our pitch was pretty simple too. Like we're just getting started. We know more about this than you do. Yeah, you yeah. can't afford $3,000. So if we get your stuff back, it'll be a hundred bucks. Yeah. Oh, wow. okay. And if we can't, it'll be zero. Awesome. And obviously we made zero money. We didn't make any money. Yeah. We were just learning. So uh, I, I kept my day job. I had to have income from somewhere. Yeah. So I kept programming at an insurance company. <laughs> and then at nights, I would try to fix hard drives. So that's how kind of we bootstrapped it is just I made money at another job and just started to pay our first employees just based on the revenue from that. And I didn't have a wife. I didn't have children. I didn't have a mortgage. And I was comfortable just blowing money on trying to go someplace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was lots of, lots of a very interesting story and lots of lessons in there. You know, first, uh, you know that you are comfortable with risk. So, you know, as entrepreneurs, uh, you need to understand how, how uh, what, what your mindset is all about, how uh, risk averse or uh, friendly you are. And then... And your spouses or loved ones. Yeah, exactly. And then your approach of, you know, trying things out first and... Uh, you know, with, with low amounts of investments and and uh, trying it with the clients, learning the system, learning the trade. That's amazing. That's, that's the right way to go. So congratulations on adopting that methodology and being successful at that. Oh, thank you. And, you know, from there, um, it only took about maybe seven months before we had five or six employees and they were less and less comfortable coming to our, the house that we were renting. <laughs> Yeah, because uh, I had other roommates who were, you know, showering in the mornings and walking around in their underwear, and it wasn't the most professional environment in the early <laughs> days. So we knew we got an office, and you know, like when it got to like all of a sudden in like year two or three, we had like over a dozen employees. We had our we were in our second office, and things really started to kind of snowball for us. Awesome, that's great, great story. Now, uh, it's been a, an amazing conversation and I think a lot of people got a lot of value out of it, at least uh, got to understand what security is all about, what they can do about it. Uh, now, before I let you go, can you tell us a little bit about your company? Where can uh, people reach you, your website? Yeah, so I, I'm, you know, you can, again, I'm Brian Gill. You can find me on LinkedIn. It's probably the quickest way. Mm -hmm. uh, Gillware.com, G-I-L-L-W-A-R-E is the website. Um, you know, people only come to us for two reasons. They either are in a horrible data related disaster and they need to get bailed out or, uh, what would be better is if they reached out again. And, and it's really only for businesses that they probably have an IT person. They probably are already spending five to $10,000 a month on all things IT and they know it's just not good enough. You know, that's when we can start to add some value by coming in, performing a risk assessment and helping them get on a roadmap to start plugging holes and basically help them spend more money. And not necessarily with us, by the way, we don't provide most of the services that we recommend. I see. Well, that's, I mean, that's the key thing to know what to fix is the, is the, is the big part. I think, you know, how to fix it and the details and all that, uh, those, those are secondary, but, as long as you know what you need to do, that's the most important thing. Yeah, so, just having that mentality of, I know it's not good enough. I'm not going to ignore this problem and be apathetic to my information being owned for the 18th time. Yeah. Like, we need to protect our business. We need to protect our employees and our clients. We don't want to have to deliver that embarrassing message to our clients that we lost all your stuff. Yeah. Get ahead of it. Yeah, exactly. All right, great. Thank you so much for being with us today and uh, sharing all your knowledge uh, so openly and freely. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks. All right, great. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much.
Uh, we'll take about a week or two to process the episode and then uh, we'll post it. We'll share it with you so that you can share with your network as well. Yeah, that's great. We'll go ahead. We'll definitely promote it. So look forward to it. And it was a lot of fun, man. Thank you so okay, much. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see you. Thanks. Bye. And that's all for now. Until next time. And if you are an existing or an aspiring tech entrepreneur, then I invite you to check out my new online workshop, Bootstrapping Your Tech Startup Dreams. Go to bootstraptechstartup.com and sign up for free. I want to make sure that more successful and sound decisions are made every day in your tech projects. Let's start finding solutions to your problems. So go to bootstraptechstartup.com and I look forward to helping you with your tech projects. If you want more engaging videos and insightful interviews with industry's thought leaders, then check out other videos we have picked for you. The link is right there. And if you want to be notified about our new content, please do consider subscribing to our channel.